I have a surprise for you guys. I have a brand new intro, and it's freaking cool. Let's check it out. I'm just kidding, I don't have an intro clip for you guys. Though, I will tell you what we're doing today. Today is going to be a little different than usual. For the past two videos, I've done uh, reactions to videos, but this time I'm going to do it to an article, which I found. The website the article is from is called Cripplegate. Now, this website was named after the Cripple Gate in London, which I believed was destroyed during World War II. Uh, you can check it out, they say it in their bio, so if you can go, you can go check it out and read why it's named Cripple Gate. Anyway, I'm getting off track, let's get back to point now. The article itself is called, Why Evangelicals and Catholics Cannot Be Together, by Jordan Stanridge. Now, you see, Jordan Stanridge here has his own website, Twitter, and Facebook. Now you see, Jordan has made several articles on Roman Catholics, so don't think this will be the last video made on one of his writings. Though, let's hop right into this article, and we'll look at the rest later. Now, this video is around two years old, so the next video I make or about one of his articles, I will um, make it more recent. Well, let's hop right into it, no more prolonging. As the evangelical world in America seems rather excited about the Pope's visit, I can't help but remember how I felt when I discovered the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document. In 1995, the unthinkable happened. Well-known evangelical pastors signed a document in which they joined themselves with Catholic priests and philosophers in an, in an ecumenical fashion in order to promote the agreements over the disagreements that have plagued Protestants and Catholics for centuries, dating back to the greats Calvin, Lutheran, Zuguil, and Knox. They agreed to no longer potentialize each other, agreeing that Catholics are indeed brothers and sisters in Christ. First off, Calvin, Lutheran, Zagui, Zaguini, Zaguini, Zaguani, and Knox are not great. They're not great at all. Just thought we'd get that out of the way. Though I don't like how he glances over this thing so quickly, the ECT, but if you wish to read more about it, I have an overview about it in the description of an article, so go check that out if you want to see more of it. It has a quick overview, so that way you just don't have to read through the, all of it. The article continues by saying, This article was successful in its endeavor. The vast majority of Christians in America do not evangelize Catholics. Someone like me, who has shed many tears over the deception of the Roman Catholic Church, is seen as hateful. I totally understand the desire to believe people are saved. I also desperately want Roman Catholics to go to heaven, but we can't let our desire for people to be saved or our desire to please men lead us to cheer them on as they run towards hell. We must love them. I'm sure later you will tell us about many of these deceptions of the Roman Catholic Church, and in turn I will defend the church. So mainly at this point, I'm just waiting to get through the article so I can start talking about those points. You're also not the first person to tell me that I'm going to hell for being in the Roman Catholic Church. So it'll be interesting to see what reasons that I'm going to hell for. The one thing I will say is that I do commemorate you for your desire to save souls. I understand the feeling of wanting to bring people to Jesus. Anyway, let's move on with the video so we can get to the main parts of why and what's wrong with the Catholic Church so I can talk about and defend her position. When I first found out about the ECT, I was shocked. I was fresh off the boat and never in a million years did I imagine such confusion over what seemed to be such a clear issue to me. In any Italian believer, most evangelical churches in Italy, many of which we would never step foot into, recognize this truth. I wondered why there was such confusion in America, and I concluded that it must come down to the easy believism mentality. In America, people believe that all you have to say is, Jesus, come into my heart, and you are saved. And it doesn't matter what you actually believe. The devil loves to come as an angel of light. He loves to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. And as Spurgeon said, he has created a masterpiece with the Roman Catholic Church. Here are some of the reasons Protestants and Roman Catholics will never agree, based on the RCC's teaching, and why ultimately a born-again Christian who attends a Roman Catholic Church must come out and join God's true church. Finally, we are about to see why the Catholic Church is so, so bad. I'm going to be honest, I just want to hop right into this section, so if I missed anything in the last few paragraphs, just leave it in the comments and I'll answer it in the comments. But without further ado, let's get into this. Authority. It is clear, therefore, that in the supremely wise arrangement of God, sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church are so connected and associated that one of them cannot stand without the others, working together, each in their own way, under the action of the Holy Spirit. They all contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, line 69. Now that part he added included into his um, uh, article, and I'll say what he put under that uh, uh, line from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. He said, 
Picture a company with three owners. They walk into a room. They all have the same power. That's what it's like in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this scripture should triumph any false interpretation in the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope and his cardinals, as well as tradition, have undermined scripture for centuries. God has not given man the right to alter his words. The Holy Spirit is in charge of illuminating the mind of his children and cause them to understand the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 tells us clearly that scripture is all we need to live a life that glorifies our creator. Now for my response. So I have a video, and it's a great video. It's by Father Mike Smits. Go check it out. It's great. But I'll also talk about it now in this video. Though real quick, if you would like to read the part of this catechism piece came from, it will be in the description as well. Christ himself set up a church. That you can see in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 19. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You should also remember that Peter's name means rock. So if you replace Peter with the rock, it reads, and I tell you our rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus established a church. The king established the kingdom. And also, when he talks about the keys to the kingdom, he is referencing Isaiah. There is the king, and then there is the Ahabit, the prime minister, and he is in charge when the king is gone. And it is talked about in Isaiah chapter 22. Jesus also gives the church a visible structure and hierarchy in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all na nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the close of the age. Jesus says they can teach and teach in his name. And you can see this in Acts chapter 15. Peter had a vision and Paul was called to do the same, that they needed to bring the word of God to non-Jews or Gentiles, because they had only been preaching to the Jews. Well, the Acts chapter 15 verse 1 to 18 says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas ha had no small decision and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnab Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us, and that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and make no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you, t do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept quiet and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return, and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will re 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 rebuild his ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. 
For Moses had had throughout many generations those who preached him in every city, being read in the synagogues every th Sabbath. If you had trouble understanding me, I will leave a link to the uh, passage in the description. I know I probably butchered it, a lot of the names and a lot of the places, um, but I'll leave it in the description if you want to read it again. Anyway, so men said you had to be circumcised to be saved. The apostles and elders got together, they debated, prayed, and eventually decided that it seems to them in the Holy Spirit that they should not impose um, circum circumcision on Gentiles. Now the problem was that Jesus had never talked about this and they weren't sure what to do. This is one of the problems with Sola Scriptura. What happens when something comes up that the Bible doesn't talk about? What do you do? In Acts chapter 15 is a moment you can see the visible church, the actual church that has the ability to teach and to teach definitively. And this isn't the only time that the church has done this. They have done this many times and it will continue on to do this. So I also highly recommend that you go and check out Father Mike Smith's video. He explains it a little bit better. He explains it actually a lot better than I do. So go check it out. It's in the description uh, as always, but I'm going to carry on. You also bring up 2 Timothy chapter 13, verse 16 through 17, which only claims scripture is profitable. And you say the Catholic Church undermines scripture when you call Martin Luther great, the man who tried to cut seven books from the Bible, the man who tried to add the word alone to Romans chapter 3, verse 28. He tried adding the word alone. It said, For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Martin Luther tried adding alone between faith and apart. He tried adding to Peter's letters. He tried adding to writings that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So you tell me, who tried undermining scripture? The next section is baptism, and he starts it off with, The church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1257. Baptism makes the Nephoite a new creature, an adopted son of God, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1265. Now, you see, he put those dots right there. You, you can probably see it because I put the uh, article up on the screen. He put the dots, and that means he didn't put the full line of Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1265. It fully reads, Baptism not only purifies from sins, but also makes the Nephi a new creature, an adopted son of God, who has become a partaker of the divine nature, member of Christ, and co with him, in a temple of the Holy Spirit. You should go and uh, read all these lines from the Catechism I recommend yourself, but otherwise, I'm going to move on. He continues by adding, By baptism, all sins are forgiven, original sin and all personal sins, as well as all punishment for sin. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1263. He then writes, The only way to heaven in the Roman Catholic Church is through baptism. Baptism cannot save anyone, especially a newborn. A baby cannot have faith. A baby cannot confess Jesus as Lord. He cannot believe the resurrection. Instead, each human being at some point in their life must repent of their sins and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. Now for my response. Baptism is recognized as a sacrament in the Roman Catholic Church. It accomplishes the three things. One, the remission of sin, original, and mortal or venial sin. Only original sin in the case of infants, for they cannot sin mortal or venial, and both for older people. Two, you receive the Holy Spirit. And three, we also receive the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to bring your attention to Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 39. It says, let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made them both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom ye crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent ye, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, into the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are far, afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto them. Now, I want to bring to your attention verse 39. It says, For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are afar off. And I also want to bring your attention to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter does not restrict baptism to adults. He continues in Acts chapter 2, verse 29. 
For the promise is to you and your children, and to all that are far off, every one whom the Lord our God calls to him. I want to add Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. These commands are universal, not meant only to apply only to adults. This also makes clear the necessity of baptism and its connection to salvation, stated in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism, that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The church has always believed baptism applies to kids and adults. Jesus said, Jesus answered, Very verily I say unto thee, Except one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 verse 5. His words apply to everyone, even children. Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 19 verse 14. Finally is circumcision. Note that Paul says baptism replaced circumcision. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 through 12. In whom he were circumcised, also a circumcision, not made with hands, and the putting off of the body of the flesh, and the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, wherein ye were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, also raised from the dead. He refers to the baptism as circumcision of Christ and the circumcision made without hands. If Paul wanted to exclude infants, he wouldn't have used circumcision as a parallel. Furthermore, the comparison is fitting. In the old law, if a man wanted to be a Jew, he had to believe in the God of Israel and be circumcised. In the New Testament, if a man wants to be a Christian, he, ha he must believe in God and Jesus and be baptized. In the old law, Jewish households, babies, would be circumcised in anticipation for the Jewish faith. In the New Testament, those babies born in a Christian household would be baptized in anticipation for the Christian faith, in which they would be raised. If an adult is about to be baptized, he first must have faith before receiving the right of membership. If a child is too young to have faith, he must be given the right of faith, with their knowledge that one will be raised in the faith. Links where information was gathered and came from will be in the description. Uh, if you would like more information and more links will also be provided if you want more. And I also have uh, some videos, I think. Though, if you were confused on what I just said, it will all be in the description. Uh, I typed it up and put, I don't know, I'll set it in the description. Now, let's uh, move on to the next subject. Confession is the next subject, and he writes, I wrote about this last week. In summary, a system that is works-based will always minimize sin. Sin will, will be easily overcome, and in Roman Catholicism, it is overcome through confession. Since he didn't really speak on this, I'm going to make a separate uh, video responding to this, um, about or responding to that article on confession alone, so I'll give that uh, article its own video, but otherwise, I'm just going to carry on. The next subject he writes about is salvation is found in the Roman Catholic Church alone. Outside the church, there is no salvation. It means that all salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. Catechism of the Catholic Church, line 846. It is in the church that the fulfillment of the means of salvation has been deposited. Catechism of the Catholic Church, line 824. Again, there's dots. You've left some stuff out. You are also cherry-picking. So I advise that you go read these lines that he included yourself. Link in the description, as always. Well, since you use the catechism, I guess I should use it too. How are we to understand this affirmation, often repeated by the church fathers? We formulated positively. It means that all salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Catechism of the Catholic Church, line 846. Now, I'm going to have articles in the description. As always, you should go and check them out. Though, this is often a principle misunderstood. In standards, you left out line 846. Actually, you included it, but you didn't include this specific line. Now, if you used this line, it would have ended your whole argument the whole forces people to believe in an institution instead of Christ. I want to cite a certain part. It means that all salvation comes from Christ, the head, through the church, which is his body. I'll say it again. It means that all salvation comes from Christ the head. The church recognizes, and you can see this through the line standards, that salvation comes through Christ. This even echoes Christ's own words, John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but by me. But I must address another part. Through the church, which is his body. I also want to pull three verses from the Bible. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. 
Luke chapter 13 verse 3, and John chapter 6 verse 54. Mark chapter 16 verse 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Luke chapter 13 verse 3 says, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. John chapter 6 verse 54 says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him at the last day. These three verses have a connection between salvation and the Catholic Church. Mark chapter 16 verse 16 has to do with baptism. Luke chapter 13 verse 3 has to do with confession. John chapter 6 verse 54 has to do with the Eucharist. These sacraments are administrated through the church. Catholics recognize that these sacraments we receive is administrated through the church. Christ offers the grace necessary for salvation. The Catholic Church administrates this grace through the sacraments, meaning it is appropriate to say salvation comes through the Catholic Church. Christ established the Catholic Church for those who knowingly and willingly, and I'll say it again, knowingly and willingly reject him and his church cannot be saved. Matthew chapter 18 verse 17. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. In his second verse, Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Paul also warns in Titius chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is wrapped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Now, you must be asking, does this mean non-Catholics go to hell? Well, not necessarily. Now, let us look at line 847 of the Catholic Church. This affirmation is not aimed at those who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ and his church, those who, through no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart, and moved by grace, try in their actions to do as well as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. Those two may achieve eternal salvation. Catechism of the Catholic Church, line 847. The Church recognizes that those ignorant of the truth are not condemned by God. This goes with Scripture. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. John chapter 15, verse 22. Now I have articles and videos in the description. Please take a look. Uh, I think they might, if you get confused, they might explain it a little bit better, and they'll give a clearer and better picture on it. Though I am moving on to the next subject. His next topic is the Mass, and he starts off as, As often as the sacrifice of the cross by which our Pash has been sacrificed is celebrated on the altar, at the work of our redemption is carried out. Catechism of the Catholic Church, line 1364. In this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1367. The Bible says that Christ died once and for all. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. He does not need to continue dying, like the animals in the Old Testament sacrificial system. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The only reason he would need to continue dying would be if we needed our sins to be forgiven each week, or if we were trying to earn our salvation. In the Roman Catholic Church, Jesus Christ is still on the cross, and every week the Father crushes him over and over again. Now for my response. In the Old Testament, there are thousands of sacrifices. Though none are as perfect as Jesus' death on the cross. Like many anti-Catholics, you misunderstand Stanridge. The Mass is not a new sacrifice. It is his sacrifice presented anew. And I'll say it again. It is not a new sacrifice. It is the same sacrifice at Calvary presented anew. So, open quotes, that the redemption won for our race should produce its fruit in us individually. Quotes, quotes. That quote came from E.J. E. Sheed's book, Theology for Beginners. Link to it is in the description. The Eucharist symbolizes grace and conveys the grace it symbolizes. Christ does not suffer again each week. He is not re-crucified. The Eucharist is a sacrifice at Calvary presented anew. I have another good quote from John A. O'Brien's The Faith of Millions. It says, The manner in which the sacrifices are offered is alone different. On the cross, Christ really shed his blood and was really slain. In the Mass, however, there is no real shedding of blood, no real death. But the separate consecration of the bread and of the wine symbolizes the separation of the body and blood of Christ and thus symbolizes his death upon the cross. The Mass is a new and perpetuation of the sacrifice of the cross in the sense that it offers Jesus anew to God and thus commemorates the sacrifice of the cross, reenacted symbolically and mystically, and applies the fruits of Christ's death upon the cross to individual human souls. All the efficiency of Mass is de derived, therefore, from the sacrifice of Calvary. Page 306. Now, standard, you would say, I want Bible verses. And well, here they are. Luke chapter 22, verse 19 through 20 says, 
And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is a new covenant in my blood. Notice he says, this is my body, not this symbolizes my body. Jesus himself says, this is my body. Another really good example is John chapter 5, verse 53 through 57. And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Also, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, They are continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. I can go on and give you more verses, though I answered your objection. Now I will leave articles that further talk about the Eucharist. Please go check them out, since I kept this one short. And now I'm going to move on to the next and final subject. Eternal life is his next topic. He starts... The first commandment is also concerned with the sins against hope, namely despair, and presumption. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2091. Presumption, hoping to obtain this forgiveness without conversion and glory without merit. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2092. Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2010. He continues by saying, Ultimately, as we see so clearly, written by their own fingers, they believe that you must merit God's forgiveness. It is not a free gift. Epiphany is chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. It is something that you must earn. And anyone who says that they are on their way to heaven without having earned it over the course of many years is presumptuous and disillusioned. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I have these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. It is not something we must earn, but it is a free gift, and we can... Have confidence in this life that we will be with him in the moment we die. Standards, you cherry-picked from the Catechism. You cherry-picked. Now become clear with what I'm about to say. The Catholic Church has never taught that you can earn or merit salvation. Catholic Answers puts it really well. Apostolic tradition in Scripture says that it is only by God's grace, completely unmerited by works, that one is saved. The Church teaches that it's God's grace from beginning to end which justifies, sanctifies, and saves us. As Paul explains in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, God is the one who, for this good purpose, works in you both to desire and to work. Notice that Paul's work presupposed that the faithful Christian is not just desiring to be righteous, but is actively working toward it. This is the second half of the justification equation, and Protestants either miss or ignore it. James chapter 2 verse 17 reminds us that faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In verse 24, James says, See how a person is justified by faith and not by faith alone. And later, for just as a body without a spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Chapter 2, verse 26. Close quotes. I will leave the rest of the article in the description, but I'm going to finish this article off. Any questions, leave it in the description, though let's finish this article. His final paragraph says, Our hearts go out to the people stuck in this false system. Our desire is not to condemn them, but to bring the truth to these people. Sometimes you have to let people know they are lost before showing them how they can be found. If you wish to learn more about how to evangelize Roman Catholics, there are 10 books I have benefited from. To help you just do that. It appears it didn't benefit you that much. I don't think this video was directed towards Catholics, but instead directed towards non-Catholics who are thinking about joining the Catholic Church or have questions about the Catholic Church. And if you do have questions about the Catholic faith or if you're looking to join the Catholic faith, please go to a Catholic website like Catholic Answers. Don't go to a Protestant about it because they're not all they're not gonna give you the right answer, alright? Go to a Catholic, go to Catholic websites, go to the one of the websites I listed down below. They will help you, they will explain things, and if you have any questions, I can also try and answer them in the description. Anyway guys, that does it for this video. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.